what it is. So what are you doing, Ricky? You're, are, are, are you playing with your, your uh, iPhone or what? Funny story, I'm actually, uh, I am in Matt Rust who can't figure out how to watch this live. He said he clicked on the hashtag and it took him to a hangout from October and Matt, the internet is just a hard place. I sent you the link. Click the link, watch the video, and be happy that I gave you a shout-out on today's episode. So we're a little early today. That's because Jason apparently always has to have a hard stop right at the time that we need to end these Hangouts. So we have to start a couple minutes early. But that's okay. And it's funny because we went to test the... Well, actually, the guests and I have been trying to test multiple days leading up to this and haven't been able to make it work. And then last night I updated my OS and... Let's just say there were a lot of technical difficulties that kept me up late and up early this morning, but we're here, we're live, and I am pumped about today's guest because today's guest is more than just a guest because he's a blogger, he's an author, and he's one of the most active members of the golf community, but we'll get to him in a second. I'm more excited about Les because he's got a new toy. Les, tell us about what you've got there. I, I, I went down to Kingsport yesterday and bought myself a new computer, man. Awesome. Well, I was going to say earlier that your your audio is better, your video is better, and your sound is, I mean, yeah, it's it's better. But I, you didn't look like you were at home. That's I was a little concerned at first that you didn't look like you were at home. No, I, I just, uh, it, the camera, you, you're right, it's got a lot better camera on it. But you got a Coors Light sign back there, so I'm going to let it slide. Um, <laughs> Le- Les is from it's always right better. You just never saw it, man. That's it. <laughs> And Jason Boslow from Shop Junior Golf, who has a hard stop. Jason, how's it going, buddy? It's good, and I'd like to say hi to Matt also. I've been trading emails with him about his kids' golf clubs. So, Are you going to get him some sticks? What's that? Are you going to get him some sticks? I don't know. He needs pink, and I don't come in different colors quite yet. So, uh, so well, we'll see. Well, I'll talk him out of that. Although, okay, I, I, <laughs> Hey, man, colors are important for a little five-year-old girl. I get it. No, they're important for me, too. Um, but now let's get to today's guest because, oh, and, I, and at the end of today, I'm going to make people watch the entire episode because at the end of today's episode, I have a massive announcement. I'm talking, like, the biggest announcement that we've had in the Google Plus Golf community maybe yet. And I think that a couple of people know what it is, but nobody else. So today's announcement will come at the very end. I might even wait until after the lightning round to make sure that everybody gets a chance to hear it. But today's guest, author, blogger, golfer, Neil, welcome to the Friday Foursome, and tell us who the heck you are and how you pronounce your last name. I'm just horrible with last names, and I think I know, but I didn't want to butcher it. So, Neil, welcome to the Friday Foursome. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, It's great to be with you. You know, I can't think of anything better to do on a Friday than hang out with you guys and talk about golf. You know, what a great concept. Um... (laughs) I don't think I even know how to pronounce my last name correctly. <laughs> but the way I the way I say it is Sagabel, Sagabel, and um, you know it's kind of crazy how I got into to writing about golf. I I I can't believe I'm going to tell you this, but I have been blogging for nine years now, and you were blogging before it was a word. <laughs> I was blogging back in the days when you had to try it. It took you 10 minutes to explain to people what a blog was. And there were there were a couple of people out there before me. If you know Tony from Hooked on Golf Blog, uh, and you guys probably do if you've been around online, Tony was out there a little bit before me, and golfblogger.com, John was out there. And there were a few others, but it really was a small, small world in, in terms of golf blogging. And I was, I, I just wanted to try blogging out, really. And it just so happened that I picked golf because I knew something about it. But I was experimenting with the medium, uh, looking for a creative outlet for my writing. And lo and behold, here I am. I've, I kept doing it, uh, and it grew into something. And things started happening in the golf world. Uh, I made some connections. Uh, bloggers became more accepted. Uh, I was interested in golf history, and through that, uh, sort of an interest in Hogan uh, writing sometimes about history, but also writing about today's game. I made a connection with a man named Jack Fleck, and that's how my first book came about, The Longest Shot, which came out in '12, uh, right around the time of the U.S. Open. That was the one that was at the Olympic Club. So uh, the book and the the book and the blog sort of work together, uh, and now I've I've written a second book that just came out a couple of months ago, and uh, just 
this whole thing in the golf space for me has been a, sort of a grand adventure of things that I never really planned, but through writing and and talking to people like you about golf, getting an opportunity to go to tournaments, getting credentialed, having the opportunity to interview not only some of today's players, but a lot of legends of the game. I've just had a, a really great time. Well, that is awesome. And, you know, Jason is the only one out of the out of the group here that's not a blogger. Jason, why don't you start blogging and fit in with the rest of us? Uh, you know, I actually have a blog attached to my website, and I probably haven't updated it in, like, six months, and it's a very bad SEO no-no, which I am well aware of. I thought you were going to say six years, and I was going to be like, wait a minute. No, no. no. That's called history. I should hire less. <laughs> well, this episode of the Friday Foursome is going to be streaming live to both the community and the YouTube, and later you're going to be able to see it on YouTube. You can see it on Golf Life TV, lots of places to be able to watch this. And I know it's going to be a really good conversation, so I'm just going to get right into it. And this episode is also presented by the Back Nine Network. And speaking of history, Les has got a lot of history, so I'm going to let him kick it off with the first question. Well, you know, the older you get, the more history you have. Uh, Neil, your 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 second book was about the Ryder Cup, and uh, the Ryder Cup is near and dear to my heart. So I have a question regarding the Ryder Cup. Uh, back when you the Ryder Cup you wrote about, uh, the Americans were just dominating the Ryder Cup. Now they're not. <laughs> we're getting our tail beat every time we turn around. So, what's the problem? Whoa, that's yeah. Um, Loaded question. What's changed? <laughs> you know, it's 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 really interesting to me what's happened. Um, you know, the, I think there's there's two main problems. It seems like, and, and and I was asked this a lot before and even after the Ryder Cup because I was I was promoting this book and uh, we talked about the modern Ryder Cup. Uh, one one problem is <laughs> for the Americans is the European players are, are just as good or better than our players right now, in my estimation. Uh, they're just as good or, or better, and they and, and this this is nothing new. This has been talked about a lot. I think we've all heard this, but I think it's true. They somehow come to this event and this format uh, and and have adapted to it, and, and they do better in this team format. They play well together. They they come out of a culture where I think they've just mastered this. Uh, they may even still have an underdog mentality, even though they've won now, whatever it is, six of seven and eight of ten. I can't I can't I can't, I can't recall. Uh, and I and I think the other thing is, you know, this this year was just sort of a washout in a way for America, and and there's been a lot of hand wringing since then. They they just sort of got pummeled this time, but um, I think our guys, if you throw this year out, I think our guys have also felt the heat, the pressure, the burden of expectations. You know, they they do very well in the President's Cup. They play a lot looser. Uh, I know the President's Cup's a different event, a different format, but, you know, they should have won in 12. They... You know, there, there's all this talk about the captaincy. We, I mean, we could get into a lot of things, but we won in eight. Uh, we lost in ten by one point uh, there in Wales. In 12, we're, we had ten to six going into Sunday. Should have won. Should have won. It, so, you know, we could have been coming into 14 with – three wins in a row or, or, or two wins in a tie or, or something better. So, you know, the matches, even though we've been losing, most of them until this year have been close. And um, I think, I you know, for all the talk of the captaincy, I just think we got outplayed this time for the most part and obviously uh, got creamed in foursomes. Now, his, record, his record doesn't really – justify my comments from this, but do you think Tiger had anything to do with the way we played this year? Well, Tiger's never been a, a, a team player. Sorry. <laughs> but, no, I know. That's why I prefaced that by saying Tiger's record doesn't help my question, but curious if Neil thinks that Tiger had an effect on the way we played. I don't know that the result would have been different this year uh, if Tiger had been there. Now, 
the 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 atmosphere in the team room, the dynamics, and, and what happened in the aftermath, that might have been a little different because, you know, Tiger's sort of the the alpha guy, and I don't know. I think this was more probably from a player standpoint with Tiger not being there. Phil was probably more seen as the guy and the team guy, and maybe that fueled him a little bit in terms of some of the comments he made afterwards. I don't know. But I don't think Tiger would have changed the result. Um, I think he, I think Tiger, with all his experience, is probably good in the team room, and the guys like him, even though he doesn't always have the best persona or image with. Yeah, careful. I think, I think, I think the guys probably, you know, I think I think there's probably some value having him in the team room, but. I, you know, I, I don't know that America would have won with Tiger on the team. Well, he would have quit after six holes anyway. His back hurts. So anyway, I'm, I'm still bitter about Tiger not playing the majority of the season. Now let's get back to your blog because you said that the blog plays a lot into the book and they, they work hand in hand. And I know Jason's got a couple of questions about the blog. I do. The first one is, is how did you come up with the name Armchair Golf Blog? I think it's a great name when you reference armchair to anything, but uh, how, how did you come up with that name, and, and were there others? There weren't any other names. You know, it was just, it was like a decision I made in five minutes, and when I started this in 2005, I didn't even really know what I was doing at all, and uh, I didn't even know how to post images on it. I, it was just, it, it originally was called the Armchair Golfer, and then I think I read a little bit on SEO and stuff like that, and I thought, I should have armchair golf blog in the name, so it had golf blog in the title, and uh, and then I sort of I didn't I wrote under my the pen name of the armchair golfer for a while, but I I think it's it's an all right name. If I was doing names today, I don't know if I'd come up with that. One of the things I noticed was, uh, and I didn't I didn't think about this, but when you're in people's blog roles, that's a good thing because if you're the armchair golf blog, you're you're at the top. Uh, because most of them are alphabetical. I never thought of that, yeah. but that helped. So, but I think it it sort of suited me too because I'm I'm sitting here at home a lot, and when I started, I wasn't playing much golf, so that was also part of the thinking behind it. I was more of an armchair golfer than a real golfer. Speaking of being at the top of a blog roll, that's interesting that you say that because Auction Southern Dunes, which starts with an A, was close to the top in regards to golf courses here, especially in Arizona. They just released um, or unveiled a six-hole mini course on their driving range, and it's pretty awesome. I should post a picture of it in the community. But the name of the course is Hashtag Mini Dunes, so it starts with a pound sign. It's now number one, and it will be on all lists, whether it's the state of Arizona or all golf courses. So they just claim the top. It's the first golf course as well in the world that has started with a hashtag. So power to social media. <laughs> Absolutely. So, the name of your book might be the longest book title ever. <laughs> um, talk about the book a little bit. Give me the elevator pitch of the book and where the name came from. And It's long. I mean, can you agree? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that's not, that's not unusual for nonfiction books. It, it, it actually, the title itself... Um, uh, well, both books. If you if if you go with both titles, they are both long. But the title of the book is "Draw on the Dunes," and then the subtitle yeah. kind of pays off what it's about. Uh, the 1969 Ryder Cup and the finish that shocked the world. Uh, but it's yeah, "Draw on the Dunes." It. I I was looking for a book, something to follow up the longest shot with. I thought maybe this author thing is, is, is going to be a good path for me and I and I wanted to pitch a second book idea and so I like history and I was trying to figure out what hasn't been done and I I had some ideas uh, not necessarily really great ones and then I think at some point I I ran across the clip that maybe some of you guys have seen where Jack Nicholas is conceding the putt to Tony Jacklin on on that final green at Royal Birkdale back in 69 and it's it's known in the golf world as the concession you know this famous moment of sportsmanship uh, they usually they usually run that every time the Ryder Cup comes on if you if you watch much of it there's a good chance you'll see it and that's for 
sparked the idea because it, it's this iconic moment. And I thought, okay, what's what's the big deal about that? I mean, I knew, you know, a lot of stuff with Jack is a big deal, but what's the full context? What's the full story? And I and as as a writer and a storyteller, you're looking for I think something that will be a compelling story and builds to a great moment. That obviously was a great moment. So when I looked into it, I, I found out that it was one of the greatest Ryder Cups ever played. And I thought, this this could be a really good story if, if there's enough there and I do it the right way. So that's how it came about. Jason, sorry, you're next, but I've got one more quick question because he's talking about Jack. And it's oh, not... It's not, not less about Jack and Tiger. That question comes later. So, have you met Jack? And if so, tell me about the first experience that you had the first time you met him. Uh, meeting Jack was surreal. <laughs> that was, this is like five minutes after I think of this idea of a book for a book. <laughs> I think, you know, that would be, you know, you're really trying to think, what would my publisher be interested in? Uh, would this book have an appeal to a wide audience? You know, and, and and would this be a story as a golf fan I'd want to read? Th those are all good things to think about. But almost immediately I thought, how am I going to interview Jack Nicholas? Uh, how, how do you do that? Now, it was my first book. I, I gained some access. I, I approached uh, legends. I, I, I've been credentialed. I've been out there on tour a little bit. So... I've learned a few things, but you know, Jack Nicholas is a pretty important guy, and uh, I thought not just him, but Raymond Floyd and Tony Jacklin and some of these other players. You think about all right to do this book right, you want to talk to them. Uh, it it took me some time to navigate that, but through PGA channels, through some of the connections I've made with uh, golf journalists. Uh, I think maybe through some of the goodwill I built up with doing the first book, and, and that gives you a little bit of, I guess, credibility. I found the path to Jack's office and went through channels and made my pitch and actually uh, sat down with him in his office suite in North Palm Beach and had an hour with him. And, and it, oh, it was... That's pretty cool. I'll tell you, you know, doing the book alone, getting that opportunity was worth the two-year cycle of doing the book, I'd say. That is really cool. Just so you know that if and when you write a book about Tiger, well, I'm going to be your assistant for that book. Just All right, let's do it. <laughs> All right, Jason, back to you. So of your two books, which one is your favorite and why? Uh, that's a hard question. Probably <laughs> the one to show Probably, probably the first one because it was my first and, and I had a lot of desire. It was very difficult. I didn't know if I, I would be able to do it. Uh, I had Jack Fleck who was pretty old when I met him. Uh, I kind of wanted to get that story out there because of my connection with him. Uh, it was a great upset story. I, I think because it was my first one, I, and I, I, you know, it's hard to say, you know, one of the things I was wondered about with the second book was when you find such a great story like the, the one in The Longest Shot, this great underdog story, you wonder, well, will I ever find another story as good? And, and I don't know if Draw on the Dunes is, is quite to that level. I think it's a compelling read. But um, I, The Longest Shot just landed on my doorstep. I did not. It, it sort of found me, that story, that Fleck story, even talking to Jack Fleck, getting to know him, hearing all his Hogan stories, and how that all happened. It came to me uh, in a way that, I, I, in a way I didn't have a whole, whole lot to do with, and it sort of picked me, whereas the second book, I, I found that topic and decided to write it. It's still pretty Good. cool, though, that you're able to be able to... I mean, that's a cool, I mean, the books are so different in that just respect that the first one found you, but then you had to go look for the second. And I'm sure writing it had a difference, too, just in that capacity. Les, back to you. Well, my my question has a lot to do with, uh, you know, if you're writing books, and, and, and obviously we're all writing blogs about golf, and we have a golf community, but what is wrong with golf right now? I mean, uh it's down 
uh, the the millennia generation isn't embracing. What what's going on? Boy, I wish I had the answer to that one. Um, Don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think it. I I think it depends. Probably depends on how you look at it. Maybe not as much. Maybe there's not as much wrong with golf as as we think. You know, there's there's a lot of focus on growing the game and uh, getting uh, people from all walks of life to participate, getting more ladies to participate. Uh, maybe maybe in this modern age where people are so busy and, they, and there's a lot of different options for sports and activities and entertainment downtime, golf isn't going to have the same following that it once did. Maybe it's just sort of adjusting. Um, I... I was talking to a guy about a week ago, uh, a publisher, and, and he, he said he didn't really see that much wrong with golf, that we shouldn't mess with it too much, that it'll find its audience. It'll People, you, you know those people who they go out and they start playing and they catch the fever. Uh, not everybody's going to play golf. It's, it's never going to be a major sport. So, you know, maybe it's not... Maybe it's just adjusting, you know, and I think the economy obviously has had something to do with it. I think America was, during the 90s when things were booming and we had real estate was going really strong, uh, we were probably a little bit overbuilt in terms of golf courses, and, and there's cost issues and access issues. Uh, pace of play, there's something that needs work. That would help. I think that helped the game all the way around. But when um, I bring people out, out to play, I mean, we have a lot of golf courses and they're all empty. You know, there's no. Yeah, that, now that's really sad. But yeah, I think there are too many golf courses. Um, and, and maybe I, I don't like some of the stuff that I think is. I, I just sort of feel like I, maybe I'm because I'm o older and I grew up playing. I'm, I'm more of a traditionalist, but. I don't like some of the sort of gimmicky things. Let's let's tweak the let's make a bunch of tweaks to the game to make it palatable for for people. Well, you know, I kind of feel like golf is what it is, and if you want an easy game, don't play it. You know, and and but I, I do think there are things that I think if we can make you know rounds shorter, not take as long, more nine hole rounds, or even people going out playing six holes and things like that because they don't have these big chunks of time, to me that makes sense. And I think if we can make it easy for people to access the game, both in terms of cost and instruction and not being intimidated about going out on a golf course to where they can play it enough to see how much fun it is, I think that makes sense too. And I think well, things like hashtag mini dunes is going to help that. I mean, the longest hole in the golf course is like 105 yards. We'll go play six holes. They're 75 yard hole, and it's good for beginners. But now I can't wait to go down there and play it, so I can see if I can break the record. I want to go yeah. shoot two or three under par. Absolutely, Jason. Back to you, buddy. So I played the six hole course over by where we're at, and it is fun, and the kids love it. So it's great for kids. So as far as growing the game goes, I'm a huge fan of those six hole, six hole. Uh, Little, little golf courses. So um, so my next question was, again, back to the writing, and I was curious if you had another book in the works, and uh, and if so, could you at least shed a subject matter with us? I don't. I don't have another book in the works. I, I sort of wish I did, but I'm just taking a little breather <laughs> and trying to figure out what's next for me. I'm going to keep doing the blog, but Tiger Woods. There's, Tiger. there's nothing else in the works. <laughs> You guys have some more ideas? Tiger. Uh, Tiger Woods? What? <laughs> yeah, go ahead and take that book. It doesn't matter what you write on Tiger Woods, and you can call that book just Tiger Woods, and we can go write it. You're right. <laughs> you're, I, you're definitely right about that. That's what we get attention and talk to sell books. Les, back to you. Yeah, well, you just got my question, right? My, my next question. I know, I know. You can't I know. One day where we didn't steal a question, but I was wrong. <laughs> When can we expect a book on Tiger Woods? <laughs> Next. Well, someone's going to do it, I guess. Um, it will be you. <laughs> someone, someone is at at some point. There there have been lots of books on him. I, I, the last big one was by his teacher, and and you know that was very controversial. And that you know 
that sells books. That that's probably was. I haven't looked at the numbers, but that was probably the best-selling golf book in in recent years. I'll but be no, curious, you know, speaking of controversial, I'll be curious if Golf Digest gets some. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen with that. But have you been paying attention to that interview that Dan Jenkins did? I was traveling uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday. I didn't see it until I guess yesterday. Yeah, I unfollowed Dan yeah. Jenkins on Twitter yeah. last night, and it felt so good. That's all I'm saying. I, I was trying to think about, the other day I was trying to think about, do I post anything about that on the blog? And I just I just said, no, I'm going to pass on that. <laughs> you know, it's just. Yeah. <laughs> probably for the uh, best. Well, probably better. Yeah, there's, there's, a lot of, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of silliness in, in this world, uh, in this world of, uh, this digital world, the internet world, and and I I kind of chalk that up to silliness. Yeah. So this is a two-part question: How many copies of the book have you signed, and where can I get a copy of the book signed? Oh, where can you get a copy of the book signed? Well, I'll have to get some and sign <laughs> sign one for you. Um, but I guess that answers the first question. I thought. I mean, I, I think that if I wrote a book and it was published, I'd probably just sit there and sign them and just be like, oh, look. I'd go to the store, grab the stack of books, and sign them. Just be like, hey, check this out. I'm going to sign my own book. <laughs> <laughs> so here's something cool I really I got to do just this week, and and they, these are I've had some of these experiences since I've started blogging. I've written a couple books, and all these things have happened that I was never planning. Because uh, and it ties in with your question. I signed a bunch of books on Tuesday night. Uh, I haven't done lots of signings. Lots of times, unless you're a really big time author, book signings don't really do that well. People don't come out for a book events like they used to in the old days. A lot of books sell online. But I got invited to uh, the National Press Club book fair in Washington, D.C. And there are a hundred authors. There are a hundred famous authors there, and me. <laughs> now, I don't know how I got invited to this, but you know there were big name political people with their books, and I got to go there. And they actually charged admission for people to get into this to talk to people like me, authors. It was it was pretty cool. And I I signed a lot of books. I talked to people. Uh, there was a guy next to me he had a baseball book we were the sports table uh, it, it was just it was a lot of fun I like signing books and I like interacting with people but I can tell you in this modern age unless you're pretty big time book tours are not something that a lot of people do and you know it's not like you travel around the country and do a lot of talks I've done a little bit of that regionally but a lot of what I've done with the book is sat at home and done Yahoo Sports Radio, or uh, I didn't go on the Golf Channel with this book. I did with the first one, and do a lot of sports radio and golf radio, and and even things like this with you guys. That's on a sports book and a golf book. That seems like sort of the best way to get the word out. I'd like it, Jason. Final questions from you. I can't believe we we're almost out of time. We started early, and we're almost out of time. <laughs> so my final question is is really not a question, but I just want to say that we've that I have enjoyed my time with you. I do want to read uh, your books. Like uh, after I saw who our guest coming up was, I was really interested in in your in your first book, and that is something that I will probably be going out and purchasing. So thank you very much for your time. But but I know that we are pressed for time, so I will pass on my last question. Yeah, and you like the last part anyway. It doesn't matter if you have a good question or not. You just want the lightning round. Last right. final question, even though we stole one of them. Yeah, where do you play golf at? Oh, good one. Well, I'm a member at a place called Great Oaks. It's about three miles from where I'm sitting. And I, it's really sad to say I haven't been playing much golf at all. Um, I'm almost, I, I could almost say I'm retired. But I grew up playing, and I played all four years in high school. I played one year at a community college. Uh, it might sound like I was good. I was never that good. I think. The lowest t handicap I ever was was five. So uh, I like playing. When I go out, I can still hit it okay. But haven't played much this year, I'm sorry to say. Let's get you to come out to Scottsdale, do a book tour, sign some books, and we'll go play 18 holes. How about that? <laughs> I'd love to do that, Ricky. 
Okay, so I don't have a final question because I know that Jason wants to see the lightning round and he's got to leave, and I'm just getting excited about our big announcement. excited about the announcement, too. I know, right. So the lightning round, nine rapid-fire questions, and I like to say that it's nine questions that you didn't know were coming, but you didn't know what any of the questions today were. So lightning round, rapid-fire, answer them as fast as I ask them. Are you ready? Yeah, is it for me? Yes, all that, yes, all nine questions. That was not the rapid fire that I was looking for, but that's all right. We're, we're practicing. I'm ready. Let's go. Uh, okay, so you're a blogger, but in the past, do you prefer pen or pencil? Pencil. What is your handicap? Uh, probably 12 now. What is your favorite PGA Tour major? Uh, U.S. Open. Favorite golf movie? Greatest game ever played. Who is your favorite LPGA Tour player? She's retired, but it's Lorena Ochoa. Ooh, I like that. That's a good one. Now, this is the most important question you'll be asked all day, and I'm sure you figured out that I'm Tiger's biggest fan, but will Tiger break Jack's record? Why or why not? No. No. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, just just get stuck on I, that I, part. I think the I think the majors drought of six years has has it's been a long dry spell. I think it's going to be hard for him to get the mojo back. Too much tough competition out there. He's he's old. He's an old thirty nine in my estimation. Okay, I'll allow that. Well, have you ever had an ace? One. Yeah. Ooh, that's that's rare. You usually hear no, or I've had six. That's good. Now, do you do you remember? This is not part of the. Lightning round. Do you remember it, and how far was it? I I absolutely remember it. It was the day the day after golf season was over. I was just playing a recreational round, and it was on about a 145 yard par three. And I didn't really even hit that good a shot, but I hit it straight, and it bounced it bounced a couple times as about a nine iron. It just rolled up and rolled in. I like it. Now I hope that I know the answer to one of these three, but who is in your perfect foursome? Perfect. Uh, I'll say I'll say say Nicholas. He's the one I was thinking. Uh, um, I'll I'll put Trevino in there too. Ooh, good one. Well, I haven't thought about this. This is this is hard. And, and I got to th think of somebody outside of golf. I'll put you, Ricky. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I'd play with. Foursome. I'd play in that foursome. I think I think it'd be fun to play with. I like that. And your final question of your Friday foursome, what is next for Neil Sagabell? I don't know. Ooh. That's an honest answer. I don't know. I'm looking around. <laughs> I love that answer. I don't know. It's funny because I sometimes preface that with don't say lunch or, or, or cocktails because that's sometimes what we get. But I don't know might be the best answer to that question. Yeah. I'm a freelance. I'm a freelance guy, and so I, I work on different projects. But I don't have a golf book going right now. Um, I'm just looking around for opportunities. I love it. Well, Jason, thank you. I know you got to rush to a meeting. Les, thank you for joining us today. Neil, thank you for supporting um, the game of golf, growing the game of golf, and writing about the game of golf. And Jason, are you are you sure you're ready for the announcement? Because here it comes. I am, I am, I am ready. I've been excited for this for a week now. I know you have, and I don't have any like hats or any confetti or anything to throw up in the air when we make this announcement. And I actually just told him last night that we were going to make the announcement today, so I hope he's watching. But we have a new sponsor for the Friday Foursome, and I am very excited about this new sponsor. And for the entire year of 2015. We are going to be able to be working closely with this organization, working closely because he on his own is doing a ton to grow the game of golf. He's got his own, I don't want to say community of people because that's kind of what it is, and I don't want it to be confused with our community, but he's got his own network of people. They're going to be able to be introduced to the Google Plus Golf community and to the Friday Foursome. But as of January 1st, the Friday Foursome for the duration of 2015 will be presented by the Back 9 Network. No, I did not mean to say that. I'm, oh my god. Can I cut this? Jay, I just wanted to see your reaction, Jason. The Back9 Network is the current sponsor. For 2015, greenskeeper.org is going to be the sponsor of the Back... Of, I keep saying the Back9. I want the lightning round to be called the Back9. Of the Friday Foursome. John Hakeem, who has been in previous Google Plus Hangouts with us here on the Friday Foursome, runs greenskeeper.org. Johnny is what you might be able to see him um, online as. Johnny 
is he's become a good friend, and we sat down over coffee a few months ago and had a conversation about what it looks like to be able to grow not only the game of golf, but to be able to grow the Friday Force on angreenskeeper.org. But I'm really excited about that. You're going to see a lot of more details coming out from that soon. There will be a press release going out on Monday about that. I'll make sure all that gets shared in the community. But as of January 1st, greenskeeper.org is your new Friday Foursome sponsor. Jason, are you excited about that? I am excited. This has been a long time coming, and uh, we're excited to grow more and quicker and faster and partner with another wonderful company. So thank you to the Back Nine for all that they have done. But we are looking forward to uh, to the next chapter. Absolutely, and and the Back Nine has been a fantastic sponsor. They've had so much going on with getting on DirecTV and moving their offices, and Shane Bacon, who I hope to have on a Friday Foursome in 2015, has been doing a ton of stuff with them, and they've got a great cast and crew over there. I was talking to Dennis Allen yesterday, and I'm just, I can't thank them enough for the, the promotion and the support that they've been able to give to us, and 2015 is going to be as, as big, and if not bigger than 20, or 2015 will be as big, if not bigger than 2014, and I'm excited about the future and what's to come with greenskeeper.org. So look forward to more details from that coming soon. And as Jesus Martinez says, make more birdies. <laughs>